directed to do today so I can everybody can see me and hear me and I'm very happy to be here um, with you this morning to share some insights some thoughts some ideas about a topic that I've been th thinking about for almost 20 years now methamphetamine use um, and so I, I want I want to start by saying I'm I'm amazed that in the 20 years we've only made small take ha, had, had made small advances in combating this what I'm going to call epidemic although we have to watch how we use that word carefully in men who have sex with men. I want to also start by saying just to do another little caveat here. I'm probably going to use the word gay bisexual MSM interchangeably. I don't have to explain why I do that, but I, I will just say that as we think about issues of methamphetamine use among MSM a term that I'm, you know, not do not love, but I'll use it today. Um, that we have to think about issues of sexual identity very closely, because because sexual orientation, as 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 the doctor just said, issues of identity are really critical as we think about health problems in our country and, and think, think about health health problems in our world. So um, I I just say that as a caveat to begin with, and so I will proceed from here. Uh, do I have to read these? No. Okay. Okay. Oh, I have to show them. See that? <laughs> and this. Um, there, are, there are no financial relationships to disclose. So what I'm going to try to do today, I'm going I'm to try to um, illustrate patterns of methamphetamine use based on research we have done at CHIPS for the last uh, 20 years. Think about the antecedents and drivers of use. And think about the associations that exist between methamphetamine use and sexual risk-taking behavior. And in 2001, I published an article called the, you know, um, HIV and methamphetamine, a dual epidemic. And I published that, uh, that article because I believe, I believe, and as many of you know, there's a very close link between sexual risk-taking, HIV, and methamphetamine use. And over the course of the next hour, we'll be discussing that association. I want to also start by saying that it's not a simple XY relationship. Like everything, everything that we study, all human behaviors that we study, there are complex associations. And this, the association between methamphetamine use and, and HIV is, a, is an intricate, complex, interesting one. And it is an association that is also interacts with numerous other factors, uh, including um, violence and mental health and housing and economics and all of these factors function together to diminish the health of gay and bisexual men and I I say that to begin with because at the heart and soul of the work that I do is a belief that health problems are interacting and intersecting that they are syndemic that where you see one health problem you tend to see other health problems right and that these problems fuel each other and there's a theory that's very true to my heart that was first developed by an anthropologist at the University of Connecticut named Merrill Singer it's called the theory of syndemics and the theory argues that health problems are there is not there is not one epidemic or two epidemics or three epidemics but there are multiple epidemics that are synergistic and for that for th and those multiple epidemics constitute what Merrill Singer referred to as a syndemic and that syndemic is driven not only by biological factors but but by psych by psychosocial factors by structural and social inequalities that bestow psychosocial burdens on certain populations which increase the likelihood of health disparities so in the, in light of that theory it is not surprising that we see uh, health problems such as HIV and substance use and mental health at elevated rates in LGBT populations which experience heightened levels of psychosocial burdens and it is not surprising that we see even higher rates of those problems in racial and ethnic minority groups who are who are also LGBT populations who are who are who are experiencing psychosocial burdens not only because of their sexual orientation but also because of their race and ethnicity and it's not even it's not even more surprising that you would see even greater numbers of health problems in people who are racial and ethnic minorities and LGBT and who are of low socioeconomic status, who have less access to means, because they are experiencing psychosocial burdens in three different domains, and so on, and so on, and so on. And so I think you get the point here that one of, the, one of my very core beliefs is that when, in, when individuals experience stress because of who they are, when they experience what the literature refers to as minority stress, you are likely to see increased health problems. How do we feel about that? 
Okay, good. So that's what I'm coming to you with today. I'm going to end today by, after I've given you some background on, on the work that we've done for the last 20 years, is some recommendations from, for thinking about how we address the meth problem. And now, it's also interesting to say that, you know, in the early 2000s, there was a lot of attention to meth, particularly in New York City, you know, um, but also throughout the state, in a way that, that there had not been before. This was a drug that for a very long time was believed to exist solely on the West Coast. And then there was this waning that went on after 2005. And then the most recent survey data, the most recent, uh, the most recent NHBS data indicate that there might be an uptick in meth use again. Now, for somebody like myself who has been, you know, who interacts very closely to the, with the community, this is no, not a surprise to me. A problem is never really eradicated. A problem just exists under the surface and it bubbles up again and again. So I'm glad we're having these conversations about meth use and thinking about how we address this problem in this in this in this community so very 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 briefly I'm going am I talking too quickly is it good okay uh, very quickly a little overview about methamphetamine and crystal meth so um, you as many of you may know, methamphetamine was a prescribed substance um, as early as the 1930s. It was prescribed to treat obesity, ADHD, and, and, and narcolepsy, among other things. It is still a drug that, is, that, that can be prescribed, but is rarely prescribed. And regulations around methamphetamine use became much more strict in the 1950s and in the early 1960s. And what you see here are just some, some ads um, uh, uh, with regard to methamphetamine that appeared in the popular press um, during the middle half of the 1900s. And one of the things that I argue in the book is that when you prescribe a drug and then all of a sudden you take it off the market, you have, and you, and you prescribe a highly addictive drug, then you're going to have a segment of the population that's going to continue to be addicted. They're just not going to stop and all of a sudden not be able to, 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 to um, experience the quote unquote benefits, I'll put that in quotes, associated with this drug. So in the late 1950s and the early 1960s um, is when we first began to see the development of street versions of methamphetamine, which I'm going to refer to as crystal meth, right? And that is partially in response to, um, a, a response to the uh, regulation of the drug in the United States. Um, so what is crystal meth? And this, uh, those are some pictures of it at the bottom. It's a street version of, of methamphetamine. It's a translucent crystal. Sometimes it's made into capsules and pills. It's yellowish and brown depending on its purity. And this is a really important issue because purity has effects on other aspects of health. Uh, it's known by a variety of different names, Tina, Christina, T, crystal meth, crank. You know, a very nasty term, redneck cocaine, it was called for a, wh a while because it was, it was thought to be only used by, you know, Midwest farmers, you know, people in red states who could not access cocaine, very nasty way to, to, to describe the drug. But it's, 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 uh, it looks like that. And it is made from a variety of different products that are shown in this picture here. So just looking at that picture, you can see that's probably, those things are probably not so good for you to put into your body. And they are, they are put together and they are cooked in a variety of different contexts, including labs that look like this, mom and pop labs, and uh, super labs that look like this. And I remember, I remember about a, I have a home in Ulster County that I come to on the weekends, which I love very much. I love it up here. And this is not a foreign area to me. I hear this Albany area. But I was looking for a, a home in the early, in the early 2000s. And I remember the real estate agent driving us around to look at various places. And at one point we went down this dirt road. And as we were going down the right dirt road, there was this bus with blacked out windows and a fan at the top. And I said to the real estate agent, that's, that's a meth lab. And the real estate agent said, how do you know? And I said, well, because I'm Perry Halkidis. No, I didn't say that. <laughs> I said, I said because, because that is what, that is, those are the kind of contexts that meth labs, those are the kind of, those are the kind of things that meth labs look like. And increasingly, um, and so it's, so you, in New York State, and you'll see a map, in, in a map in a second, there are, is this per, per, proliferation of labs that we've seen over the course of the last decade. It's also become a drug that's mu much more efficiently produced, so there are small apartments in New York City that have been busted in the last several years that are meth labs. So on this, in this map here, you see uh, uh, the, um, uh, a map from 2014 that shows about 9,300 uh, lab incidents. So these are places where, where uh, 
labs and uh, dumps related to labs have been found. And you'll see in New York State that was that was it was 200 in that year. If I showed you this same map from 1999, there would have been maybe 15 or 20 seizures in New York State. And over the course of the last 20 years, the drug has moved, moved eastward, and the production of the lab has moved eastward. And one of the arguments is, one, supply and demand, as the demand for methamphetamine has increased on the, in on the East Coast. That has uh, caused the prol proliferation of these labs. But two, more efficient ways of making the drug have allowed it to be made in states that are a little more densely populated like New York as compared to states like Oregon and California where there are tons of meth labs in the 1980s and 1990s where there's also bigger, wide, wide, more open spaces. And in this map here, you can see this is actually a really, I think, important map. Um, you see in with those dots uh, recent meth seizures, and you see in New York State, lots of them in upstate New York, but also some in the New York metropolitan area there. Right? So, the, 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 the drug makes its way from all of these locations into all of our communities. In recent years, because of regulations around the production, uh, in recent years because of the regulation on some substances like pseudoephedrine, it is increasingly difficult to make it. Pseudoephedrine is, pseudoephedrine is the, a key ingredient in meth production. Um, it has been, uh, these labs have not increased at the rate that they were increasing previously, and in recent years there has been an increase in the importation of drugs from Baja California and other parts of Mexico into the United States. Now, the challenge there is that those, those versions of the drug appear to be based on some recent analysis, much more powerful and much more pure than, than so that's in some, some ways a good thing, right, much more pure than the versions we make here, but that importation is really, really key. And, um, I don't have to go into the politics of all of that. Okay, you, many of you who have worked with substance users know the challenges that, that manifest when you work with a substance user. I think this picture is really dramatic here, showing this, 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 this individual who was at 28 years old, uh, began to use meth, and by 37 years old, looked like that. So the 37-year-old the 37 year old picture looks like somebody who is much older than, than 37. And this is just an indication, a, a, I think a very a graphic indication of the, uh, the effects, of the physical effects of meth. This doesn't even touch into the psychological effects and the social effects of meth. meth. I will say that, yes, dr that like any drug, meth is a drug that is that is physiologically debilitating, but methamphetamine is also one that is psychologically debilitating and one that is socially debilitating. And it is not, it is not uncommon to see social deterioration. People lose their families, their friends, their jobs when they are become, become highly addicted to methamphetamine. This picture here also is just a very brief overview of the various uh, physiological effects of meth on the body. There are cardiovascular effects. There are evi there's evidence of, st uh, of, of strokes that are induced by methamphetamine. There is increased weight loss. Um, there's, there's a variety of different uh, respiratory ailments that arise with consistent meth use. It is a very damaging, da damaging drug to the body. Not surprising given those elements that are made to produce it. Right? But most importantly, I think, are the, uh, in, addition, in, in addition to, let me just actually do this also, um, the physiological of, of, of effects of methamphetamine, before I get to the psychological effects, um, there is this intense rush that people experience after they use the drug. And the drug is used in a variety of different ways. It is snorted, it is smoked, it is injected, it is eaten. It is, it is, in most situations, individuals start by snorting the drug like they do with cocaine. That is not the most efficient way of using the drug. Over time, when somebody develops an addiction to the drug, injection, it becomes the most efficient way. But that doesn't usually, is, that is not usually the way somebody starts using methamphetamine, but they eventually get to it. Smoking is also a very efficient way of using the drug. Um, what the drug does and why the drug is so powerful is that it releases large amounts of dopamine into the brain. And dopamine, as you know, is a neurotransmitter associated with feeling great, feeling pleasurable. The other effect that meth methamphetamine has is that it, when dopamine is released into the brain, you feel pleasurable. And then there's this reuptake of the, of the, of the dopamine by the, by the synapses, right, by the, neuro, by, the neuro, by the neural ends. 
with met what methamphetamine does, in addition to producing these large amounts of dopamine, is that it also prevents the reuptake of, dop of the dopamine. So the dopamine just stays in the brain and somebody is feeling really, really good for a really long time. This is, in my view, why this drug is so psychologically addic addicting. Now, let me go back to my earlier point. If you are an individual who is experiencing societal stress and minority stress and psychosocial burdens and you don't have a job and you're being discriminated against because of your race and you're being discriminated against because you're gay and you don't have a place to live, and I mean, I can go on and on and on, right? Obviously, there are proactive ways and there are probably better coping mechanisms for dealing that than that than using meth. But in the short term, this drug makes somebody who is feeling really bad feel really good, right? And that's where the psychological addiction comes in. Even for those 72 hours or those 48 hours when somebody is high, they feel on top of the world. And the problems that one is experiencing in one's life don't seem so bad in light of the use of this drug. And this is the challenge I think we have in dealing with this addiction. The, psych the psychological aspects of methamphetamine addiction are incredibly, incredibly powerful. So the public health person in me says, so there's a psychologist in me who says we should do some behavioral interventions and there's probably some harm reduction strategies and there's probably, you know, other, there's probably some like, you know, contingency management approaches that we can use and all of those are really great and I completely support them and believe them and there's been some evidence about treatment being affected for meth use with regard to those. But the public health person in me says, you have to address the societal and structural factors at the same time. And this is very much like the belief I bring to dealing with HIV. Yes, HIV is about a virus. Yes, HIV is about a behavior. But ultimately, HIV is also, also a socially produced phenomenon in our country, right? And so that's why you see it lodged in the most marginalized populations. Anyway, back to dopamine. You know, this is like, I'm, I feel like I'm on top of the world feeling here, right? So everything feels really, really good. So. Over the, that's the little background there. So co over the course of the last 20 years at my center, Center for Health Identity, Behavior, and Prevention Studies, we have done a series of studies related to methamphetamine. Some focused on methamphetamine and some for which methamphetamine is, is increasingly a part of a larger component of our study. I would say to you actually, if, we, if you asked me 20 years ago what I did for a living, I would say I was, I'm an HIV behavioral researcher. And I would now say to you, I am a sexual minority men health researcher because I think HIV is just one small piece of the larger constellation of health issues faced by gay men. And if we solve HIV by 2020, which we're going to do in this state, right? Maybe. Uh, it means people have to take PrEP and t stay under meds, but that's another, that's another lecture. I won't go there. Um, the point here is that we've been studying methamphetamine as, as time has gone on from, an is from isolated studies focused on meth, meth focused in the larger context of a, a variety of different things that we're studying. So this is a very, 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 very full chart but you have these slides, so you can look at these, you know, at your leisure, that shows from our first study, which is called Project TINA, to our most recent study, Project P18, which I will talk about a little bit today. It's a cohort study of young men who have sex with men. Um, the, the samples and the demographics of the, of the individuals that we've studied, the, age of the, the average age of the people we've studied, and the sexual orientation. Why do I put this up? Well, one, we do not have any epidemiological data on methamphetamine use in, in gay men because we don't really, sexual orientation isn't often measured on large epidemiological studies. That's changing. We're better in New York State than most states because we're in New York State. Over, I think over the course of the next several years, we will see, we will be able to access um, epidemiological data on meth use in, in gay men. I can tell you how many me men use it and how many f women use it, but I can't really tell you how many gay men. So I put this chart up because I think it's important to nest the findings that I'm going to share with you today in relation to the sample that I'm talking about, right? I think that you can tell, I can tell a story about meth that might look very different with five different samples. And so knowing this, I think, is critically important. I think the takeaway points here are really that you're going to see is, and I'm going to tell you today, is that this is a mostly a gay sample, right? Most studies of MSM are gay men. Um, slightly older, which is a point we're going to come to later, is particularly when we talk about P18. So Project TINA. Project TINA was the very, very first study we did in late 1999. And why did we do this study? 
because as a researcher who's embedded in the community, and as a gay man who used to go to the gay bars in New York City when I was a young man, I will tell you, well, that's how you get your research questions. How else do you get your research questions, right? Uh, there, were these, there, were, there were these two bars on the West Side Highway. I don't know how familiar you are with New York City, but that whole area, the, the, the bars I used to go to as a young man were in what would be considered the very sketchy parts of New York City. Right now, like there's Stella McCartney and Diana Van Furst and Burke shops, and it's completely changed, okay? That's what just happens. Um, so anyway, there were these two bars there, and I would go to these bars, and it, you know, like you know, like is o often the case, you would go between one bar to another because you th thought somebody better would be at the other bar, but in fact, it was the same people in the, in the other bar, right? But there was always a drug user, a, dr a drug seller who, s who was situated between the two bars, and he would offer different kinds of drugs. And somewhere in, in the late 1990s, in the mid to late 1990s, meth became part of the menu of the drugs that he was offering. And this was interesting to me. I had been aware of meth because of, because of, my, of my travels to the West Coast, where many gay men were m using meth, but I was not aware that it was making its way to the East Coast. And in fact, in one of these early studies, and you'll get to this slide in a second, one of the things that we, we've learned early on is that the transition of meth from the West Coast, LGBT gay population, to the East Coast had to do, was in part um, instigated by the travel of men back and forth between the coasts. So an individual from the East Coast went to the West Coast, the behavior was modeled there, and the behavior was brought back. You need meth on these and the drugs, and you get the whole story, right? I don't have to go from there. So anyway, here's, here's the thing. When we asked, this is now, let's go 1999-2000. So this is, these are data that are, that are somewhat dated, but I will tell you that they are pretty consistent. You know, if I were to do the study today, I would get pretty consistent results, except probably for two things. One, the race of the individuals using meth, and this is gonna be a really, really, really important point as we go on to the talk. And two, the level of injection use. Early on, so, we, so I'm not gonna give it away, I'm not gonna give that away yet. So early on we asked, we asked the individuals in the study to tell us uh, in the last three months how often have you used meth? And not surprising, you saw in this study, as we saw in many studies early on, this was a weekend drug. This was a drug that individuals used on the weekend. And the challenge, I think, for many of us who are doing addictions work is that there are individuals who are functional, I put that in quotes, who are using drugs on the weekend who do not think they have a problem with meth, right? And so getting those individuals into addiction treatment and into care when they perceive, when they're pre-contemplative, if I could use a stage of change term, into care is a big challenge. And by the time they've moved on, it's maybe, it's, it's too late. It's much harder to eradicate the addiction. So this was a, a weekend drug, right? And here's what Bob said. Bob, who's 32 years old, who we interviewed at the time, he said, I'm probably using it once every two weeks, something like that, generally on a weekend, either, I guess, under two circumstances. One is wither at the bath, or, and I don't ever change what the words people use when I interview them because I think it says a lot um, or if somebody comes to my apartment and we do it there so what does this tell me right away this quote here's this young guy who's using meth with sex right on the weekends and this was the story and this is the story we had for a very long time during the, during the same study we asked the individuals during the last three months um, w when did you, w how, was, how was meth used in relation to sex? And you can see here that most of the use of meth was in relation to sex. So there you get the sex meth link. There you get the beginnings of the problem and the concern that appears in the literature about meth. Again, meth's been around for a very long time. While all of a sudden in the 1990s are we really, really concerned? One of my, the arguments I make in the book is because the link between meth and sex is so great, the HIV epidemic is perpetuating in gay men, the transmission of HIV increases in light of meth. And that's why I think we had so much attention to meth in the literature over the course of the last 20 years because of the HIV piece. Had there not been an HIV piece, might we have gotten the same attention? I don't, I don't know. But the, but the HIV piece made it really, re really incredibly important to address. And so this is John, who's 54 years old, saying, I find that my experience of crystal is very context specific. Taking it at the baths is very different from taking it in my apartment with one other person. I think that my sexual experience has changed somewhat to profoundly over time. I find that sexual experiences on crystal are quite different from sexual experiences without crystal. I find them much more interesting and engaging. 
Now here's a psychological, this is the beginning of a psychological addiction. And, and individuals who we've interviewed who've stopped using meth tell you that the sex they're having post-meth is nothing like the sex they had, what the sex they thought they had, I want to say that, while they were high on meth. And I think this is one of our challenges there. When we, well, we also asked the individuals in the study if they were using, they were using other drugs. And this is, again, will be not, not surprising to any of you, is that drugs are not used in isolation. Poly drug use is the name of the game. And here, as you will see, are a variety of different drugs that the, indi that the men in the study reported that they were using with meth. Viagra, right. Viagra, why? Why? Meth, meth is a stimulant. Meth causes erectile dysfunction. If you want to have sex, you're going to use meth with Viagra. And this is a very common combination. So here's Paul, who's 22, 22 years old, who says, yeah, I mix and match with other drugs, definitely marijuana, you know, alcohol, cocaine sometimes. It just depends. It depends on what's available at the time and where I am. And when we asked people where they were using meth, you will see here that almost always it was it, uh, it, at a, a lover's or friend's home, again, in a sexual context, um, at bars often where they were meeting people, at bathhouses, and sometimes at home alone. And how do I understand the home alone factor? How I have come to understand the home alone factor from the interviews and over the course of the last two decades is a little bump of meth before one goes out to, so to socialize. Um, and the story of socialization and the ability to socialize in, in certain contexts is, I think, a, a key factor here. Not surprising, meth users befriend meth users, right? So in this, in this slide here, what you will see is that, that, that only 4% um, uh, of the sample indicated they had no friends who were using meth. So here's Daryl who says, yes, I've done it with some friends every time I've done it, and we've done it in different atmospheres. The first time was at their home at a party. The other time, well, a couple times we were at their home at a party, and a couple times we were at a sex club, commercial establishments, including the last time. Now, I have a bunch of these slides, but I'm just going to show, I'm just going to show you, uh, I think, one of them. And in this study, we looked very closely at the sexual behavior of the participants. Um, these are HIV-negative participants um, looking at their sexual behavior on the far left with HIV-negative partners, with HIV-positive partners, and with HIV-unknown status partners. And you look at the two columns, one without crystal and one with crystal, and the red showing the condomless, and you see pretty consistently, especially with the unknown partners, which is um, not, not surprising, a real increase in the condomless sex, even with the positive partners, right? So when you are feeling on top of the world, when you are, when, when, when sexual adventurism is what you're seeking, when, when dopamine is in your brain, condoms, I don't care how much self-efficacy you have, right? You know, all those behavioral models, condom use is going to be an inc incredible challenge. And this is why I think we're incredibly lucky in 2016 to have, um, to have approaches like PrEP available to us and treatment as prevention available to us. And here's Andrew who says, I've been in New York two years next month and my crystal use since I've moved to New York has sort of crossed over primary into the sexual arena. I would say that I probably use it two to three times a month now in sexual situations. To be very candid with you, in the, pe in the past year, I sort of found myself drawn to the crystal crowd. And a lot of times it's kind of like a domino effect. I meet more and more people from this crowd and it's a group that tends to be, there's a lot of sex parties. Okay, so here we go with the sex link again. And not only anal, oral uh, sex is evident when meth is used, but because of the, the way that the drug works and because it, it disinhibits so greatly, what you tend to see is different other kinds of sexual activities that men engage in, gay men engage in, including fisting and S&M and group sex activities that are much more common, that are reported with increased frequency when somebody is high on meth than somebody is not high on meth. Now really, I could probably say, say this is cocaine too, and you get a similar pattern here. Uh, but the point I'm trying to drive home is that the disinhibition leads to risk. Okay, so that study led to this study uh, called BUMPS, 
boys using multiple party substances. That's kind of smart, right? Uh, right. And so this was the cross-sectional cross work that we had done in Project Tina, and now is going to make it into a longitudinal study. And so we followed individuals who are club drug users over the course um, of a year. And so to be in the study, individuals had to report six instances over the course of the last year of one of those six, uh, of one of those five drugs, crystal, ecstasy, coke, GHB, or ketamine. And we followed them every four months, and we looked at patterns of use over time, and we looked at seroconversion over time, and what have you. And what I want to start, what I want to tell you with this slide, which I will come to again later on, is that meth is not the first drug that young gay men go to. And you, you'll see right there, coke often is. Meth so comes some, come somewhere later. And I think this is really, really an important uh, conversation point for us today. Because um, as you will see from the P18 data, meth use in young gay men is not as common as it is in older gay men. But what that tells me is how do these young gay men get to meth use later on? And are there drugs if we believe in gateway theory, and I'm not really sure I, I believe that, but let's go there. Are there, there. are there some drug patterns that will get men to meth use more so than other drug patterns? So if I, in other words, I, I was saying to you, if I was asking you know, Governor Cuomo for money to deal, deal meth, I would not ask for money to deal with 18-year-old gay men. I would ask for him to deal with what I will say to you right now, HIV positive black 40-year-old men but I gave away the whole story now. All right, but so anyway, go on. And again, in, the, in, in, and in, this, and in this slide too, what you, see, what you see in this study, again, just reinforcing what I showed earlier, is that poly drug use was very common with, m with only 8% of the sample indicating that they used meth with no other drug at the same time. Um, and here are some of the combinations, again, reinforcing what I showed earlier. Alcohol, alcohol, marijuana, inhalant nitrates, Viagra are very commonly used with crystal. You can look at the top, especially alcohol use. Alcohol use, what I should sometimes refer to jokingly, but I shouldn't make a joke about it, is the water for gay men, you know, is like, it's like a social lubricant and a hydra. It's just, it's just very much in the mix for many gay men, right? And so um, there it is. Now, in the study, we also did qualitative interviews, and we tried to, and I'm going to go back to this before I give that away, we looked at what is it that meth gives you. So we did interviews every single time with the participants in our study, and we asked them about what are the advantages were or what the benefits were for using particular drugs. I'm going to show you the data, the qualitative data on meth use. We did a, quali a qualitative analysis of thematic coding and found that you could understand meth use along three domains, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but there was the physical domain, which is included their use for meth for facilitation of sex and sexual sensation. There was the emotional domain, which was to escape, cognitive, cognitively escape, and McKiernan, Ostro, and Hope, one of my favorite, favorite articles from 1996, and that was a long time ago. Some of you maybe some of you weren't even born. In 1996, McKiernan, Ostro, and Hope wrote about cognitive escape theory and cognitive escape theory that if you want to disengage, and they were writing in response to the AIDS epidemic, if you want to disengage from the reality of AIDS and substances is the way you disengage, and how, that's how they understood it. And then there stood the role of bars and clubs as facilitating all of that. Anyway, back to the point here. Emotional enhancement and cognitive escape were the emotional reason that individuals gave for using meth. And then finally, social interactions. Now. I'm going to now say something really, really hard about the gay community, and this often gets me in trouble when I, pre when I present to gay men. It is very, I started this talk by saying that um, L gay men, and I'm going to use, continue to use that term, experience psychosocial burdens in our society because of structural and social inequalities, and that those structural inequalities create these psychosocial burdens which increase health disparities, right? I totally believe that completely believe that, and I've been able to show that time after time after time in my papers and in my analyses. But there's also another piece, and the question that I, that I often pose to um, LGBT groups is, what responsibility does the gay community have for the continuation of and the perpetuation of drug use within the community, right? So when you look at behaviors in certain contexts of the gay community, drug use is normalized, right? Alcohol use is normalized, right? S in some situations, sex without condoms is normalized, right? 
And I'm not judging, but I'm saying that th if, in, if we're going to really address this problem, yes, we need to deal with structural inequalities, but there also needs to be some self-reflection in the community about the behaviors there. So the other story I always say, tell about that is, if you were to open any, any of those magazines that are out in gay bars and gay clubs, like Next or whatever they are, I don't know, I'm an old married man now, I don't know, right? But when I, it, was, it was HX and Next, you open it up and people look a certain way, right? And they're often white, and they're often 20, and they often have perfect bodies, right? So think about this. You're a young gay man who doesn't look like that who is leaving a home where, you know, your parents didn't really understand what it was to be gay and may have, in fact, even have rejected you for being gay. And now you find yourself in this community which is supposed to embrace you because you are gay, but maybe not so much because you don't look this way, right? And so I think that the challenges for young gay men particularly have to deal with this transition from many unaccepting families to sometimes a very rigid and demanding gay community. And so I do, I do that little sidebar because I don't want to say, uh, I, I think it's very simplistic to say, oh, it's, you know, it's the society that causes our problems. It, it, I believe that. But also there's a, there's a, there's a responsibility that, it, that has to exist in the LGBTQ population that we need to account for. And so that was a long sidebar for this slide. Um, I also want to tell you another story. I'm actually starting a new book right now as we speak, and it's really exciting. This is my new book, is looking at the coming out process of gay men who came out in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, O's, knots, I don't know what we say, that, and the now, in the tens. And my argument is in the book that there are sociopolitical contexts of the time that shape the coming out process that I really believe are true. But there is a psychological process about coming out that it, could, it looks the same in 1966 and 2016. That's my thesis. Stay tuned. Um, the interviews will all bear it out. I'm, these, in, these interviews should be really interesting. Back now, really to the point I'm trying to make, which is that social interaction and the ability to socialize these very demanding environments are often a factor that gay men cite for the use of meth and for the use of substances. It is easier to interact that way. Now, fast forward to 2016, and those social interactions happen often on this, and not in the bar in the or the club, but this also requires that you are not feeling uh, that your self-esteem is sort of elevated, right? And so the drug still has a very important or important key role to play in allowing for social lubrication to occur. Okay, so here's just some more slides from this study about where it's used, dance clubs, bars. If I were to do this now, you probably, I probably would not get those same numbers because social navigation doesn't look the same way. Um, now, we also looked at HIV status. We tested the men every single time for their HIV status. They were all negative to begin with, and then over the course of the study, some of the men seroconverted. And this is the distribution of the men who seroconverted converted over the course of the study. 11 of the 274 HIV negative men. And so the question is, does meth use lead to HIV seroconversion? Does X lead to Y? In research methods books, it's always that simple, right? But we know in life that it's never that simple. And so here's what I'm showing you. What I'm showing you here is that the answer is sometimes meth use leads to seroconversion. That if you look at, um, if, if, you, if, you, if you look at the, the people on the left who are the confirmed H negatives and the people on the right who are the people who are actually seroconverted, right, the, of those 11, what you see is that when they are high, look at the red line, their receptive anal intercourse increases greatly, right? But there are some people, right, who um, when they're high, um, their HA, th that, 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 that when, they're, when they're high, their, their unprotected anal intercourse does not increase. This is all to say that meth use in and of itself must lead to a certain disinhibition, must lead to a certain behavior, which may lead to seroconversion, and it's not that simple as you use meth and you become HIV positive, right? And that, so there are some people who can probably very effectively use meth and never become HIV positive. Likelihood is low, but, but I, don't, I, I think it's too simple to say that X causes Y. X causes Y, which causes Y1, Y2, Y3, Y4, Y5, Y6, probably some confounding factors here and here, which leads to Z. Okay, Project Pump. This is one of my favorite studies ever. 
um, uh, project under, uh, understanding men's physicality. So the New York City Department of Health, God bless them, came to us and said, we want you to do a study about the health of gay men, but we don't want you to do what you usually do, which is go to bars and clubs. We want you to go to the gym because those guys are health seeking. Um, and I thought, oh, that's sure. Absolutely. They go to the gym. What I knew in the back of my mind is that those guys go to the gym so they could go to the bar and have sex, right? I mean, the math is very simple here, right? But I was happy to do the study, and we recruited the sample at gyms, right? So it's Project Pump. Now, this is a health-seeking sample, right? They go to the gym. They exercise. So this is their substance use. 24% of them were using meth actively. 35% inhalant nitrates, about 7% GHB, this health-seeking sample, all right? And I, I, I think this slide is really critically important. I think this, of all the, t of all the, of the, all the studies, this is the most important to me, because I think it tells the whole story, right? It's that, it's, yes, it's not just about, it's not just about a club or a bar or a, or a lover, but it is pervasive throughout the population, doctor. So is this a bar, excuse me, a, a gym, are these gyms that are mostly attended by gay men? Not all, no. 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 So this could be your average planet. Just exactly. We went, okay. we went, and not just in Manhattan. We went all over the city. We went to Staten Island, because you have to go to Staten Island, you know, and all of that. Yeah, they were, we went everywhere. We just didn't go to gay identified places. But as they were coming out, and we were standing there, um, I didn't do that, but my, my, when my team was standing there, moving back here, they asked them, are uh, you a gay man, are you a bi man, and if they said yes, then they asked them to do the survey. Yeah, yes, that's a really, really, really good question. Because that's, and that you imagine that if it was just gay gyms, these numbers actually might be higher. Right, that's a really good point, yeah. Okay, so when we ask them, then when we look at the meth, the meth use in the sample, you'll see what I said earlier, which is a lot of inhalation, you know, some smoking, right? 24% used meth. And at that point, the beginning of what started to appear, uh, started to appear, now we're in 2006, 2007, injection. Not surprising that you begin to see injection as meth becomes more prevalent in the population. And when this, uh, this slide is kind of like messy, but basically what this slide shows us is that individuals who are drawn to meth use, one, indicate higher levels or higher interest in barebacking, that term, I don't even know if we use that term anymore, but barebacking, condomless sex, a desire for condomless sex, they're more depressed, and they, they, they define their, their, their masculinity by their, their appearance and their sexual behavior, right. This all makes total sense, right? These guys who are going to the gym to look a certain way, to have a certain kind of sex, who probably have some moderate, some probably have some mild depression. I think moderate to mild untreated depression is a key factor in risk taking in the gay population. Um, and something, and this was an interesting study in, out of Australia about a decade ago that showed if you put even mildly and moderately gay men on antidepressants, risk taking decreased. Kind of interesting that. Um, but um, the point here is that it, this continues to tell the story that we've been seeing. And what also we began to see it was that this drug was not confined just to white men. So now let's go back to 2004. I'm at this great conference in Hawaii on the Big Island. It was really great. And it was a conference sponsored by NIDA, and it was a conference on meth. And we were talking about meth. And some very, very important person said in the room, Oh, I don't think black men will, I don't think black gay men will use meth because they have a different allele which will cause the, you know, the, the sort of the, the, cons the, the reaction to meth to be different than white men. And I said, whoa, 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 whoa. I said, in New York City, where everybody socializes with each other and we're all on top of each other, and even in other parts of the, of the country where there's social navigation, behavior gets translated from one group to the other. And so, I said, I expect black men will be using meth at the same rates, if not higher, than white gay men over the course of time. And this is exactly what, actually what we've seen over the course of the last 20 years, is that black HIV-positive gay men, you'll see in a few minutes, are often users of methamphetamine. And so um, this was the beginning of actually starting to see that. Right? HIV-positive men also, and I'll come to that, there's another story there. 
We then did a study called a mask methamphetamine and social cognitions. This was a study to actually where a colleague of mine was doing work on social cognitions, which is the way somebody interacts with the world. And I was doing work on meth and I'm like, oh, this is, we should combine our efforts because um, meth users have faulty social cognitions. The way they read people's faces and the way they read emotions, the way they're interacting with the world is colored by their meth use. So there's interesting data on that. But here is like now 2007 and 2008, and we're still, this is a, 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 a chart of showing meth use. We did a, a what we called, a t we did a timeline follow back. We did a calendar for the last 30 days for each person where we, and every single day indicated what drugs and what sex they had. It's actually a really good technique that we use consistently in our studies. We actually start with, if I were doing the study with you today, I would ask you, I would give you a calendar for September and say, circle the important days in September. My mother's birthday, my birthday, Labor Day, is that li Labor Day, blah, 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 blah. And I'd start from those and say, on that day, what drug, drugs and sex did you use? And then I fill out a whole calendar because you remember better on special days what you did than on non-special days. And then by the end of the month, I have a whole month of like data on sex and drugs, which is incredibly interesting. But we took that data and sort of like tore it apart and looked at their meth use patterns. And not surprising, even now, even at this point, we were seeing the people in our studies as weekend meth users. Why were we not seeing more? Because I believe the people who were more, more chronic users were not going to come and be in our studies. The more chronic users were probably often in their homes looking for sex, grinding their teeth, right, really, really addicted. And you, it's very challenging to get those types of individuals into study. So this is an, uh, an underestimation, I believe, of the severity of the problem at this time. Right, it doesn't capture th that. And then we did another study called Project Muse, and this was very recent. This is now 2010, and I show you this because it shows, this is 100 people. These are convenient samples. Let's bear this in mind. But what you begin to see super duper clearly here is that the users of the drug start to become non-white men and start to become non-white HIV positive men. So of, of the total sample of 100 individuals who we recruited into the study, 57% of them were black. And if you look across there of the HIV positive individuals in the study who were, who were there, 69% of them were black. So HIV positive black men started to be using it. And we did an analysis, I'm not gonna show you the slide yet, we did an analysis to look at the, uh, the temporal relationship between methamphetamine use and seroconversion, right? Because you read the literature, use meth, HIV. But in fact, what this data begin to bear out and what I've been talking about for a while is that for some HIV positive people, meth use comes after seroconversion. And here is the data on that. And what you see here in this particular sample, again, a very small sample, is that 65% turn to meth use after seroconversion. This is controlling for a lot of time factors, too. Why I want to stick to the slide for just another 30 seconds is because I think it's important to remember that HIV-positive people also experience different kinds of burdens, and that, go back to what I talked about earlier, meth use provides, alleviates the stress associated with those burdens. So. Uh, there are numerous problems associated with being HIV positive and using meth, but the idea that you, s that you only, only, only meth leads to HIV is too simplistic. In fact, meth use may be a very effective way to deal with HIV, especially if you're poor and can't get your meds and don't have a place to live and are discriminated for because you're gay and discriminated for because you're Latino and so on and so on and so on and so on. Yeah, okay, so I'll leave that. So that led us to Project Hope. And this study was a study where we said, where we, in response to that very smart person in Hawaii, said, we're going to do a study of meth use just in black men. And this was a study here. Um, it's a very, very small study, but I think it's a very telling study. So in, in this, this very small sample of 50-something black men, um, there was, they, they, had in, they were indicating use of meth use in about nine of the last 30 days. So that's, right, that's like weekends, so that's still kind of the same. They were average 33 years old. They were spending an average of $159 on a, a month on meth. They, f about half of them were trading sex for meth. And um, they, 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 were, they were trading it on an average of about four times a month. And I we'll have one more thing to show you here about this sample. What's really interesting here is look at their economic status on the left, right? So this is their uh, personal, personal monthly, their monthly, that's actually, this is their, I should say, annual income there. And they're spending $159 a month on meth. So, you know, 
and look at their employment status there. So here is a confluence of lots of very, very complicated factors in the lives of these men. And we were able to also map out New York City. If, if, I, if I were to do this map of meth users in 1999, it would be, can I move over here for a second? It would be here in the village in Chelsea, right? But in fact, when I, in this sample and in samples since then, you see spreading throughout the city, the Bronx, northern Manhattan, areas that are predominantly non-white, less poor. If I were to show you the HIV slides, which I think I always show to my class when I, teach, when I teach health disparities, if I were to show you parts of the city that light up because of HIV infections, you see these same parts in Chelsea and the village. But then when I show you where people are dying, they're not dying in Chelsea and the village but they're dying everywhere else. So uh, I think um, I, I, I put this up here because I, I, it's, a, it's a way of telling us a, a story in lots of different ways about not only the disparity around meth use and its impact on the black population, but the disparity that exists around HIV, even in New York City. And when we asked gay men again about their use of, uh, of meth, they talked about the challenges they experienced in their childhood and adolescence that led to their pressures that they were feeling, many of which those pressures were being a black man in a white gay community, and that led to their use of, of meth over time. And so here's one of these men who said, meth is definitely an outlet. As, for, as far as any, like, you know, known drugs is actually, you know, it's an outlet. You, you don't have to be enclosed in your skin. You can come out of yourself more. And this one, I think, is incredibly telling. You know, if you don't look white enough or black enough, you know, you don't think it's just because we're all gay. We are, we are, we're, we're all. I mean, it seems like we're peers, but there's still that, there's still the, that wall, that stumbling block, and the drugs help you break through that wall. And I think this is the idea of social inclusion and being part of a larger community is really critical, especially for these men. So I'm going to conclude with this final study. Uh, this is Project 18. This is a cohort study that has been funded by the NIH for the last nine years. It's a really amazing study. And we followed, we recruited um, MSM who are 18 years old beginning in 2009, and we have been following them every six months ever since. They are now 23, 24 years old. We test them for HIV. We test them for every bacterial STI in multiple locations. Recently, we've enacted an HSV and an HPV. We're actually, we're actually doing a, a, um, an analysis of the HPV that they're exposed to, which is um, shocking and horrible because so many of them are not vaccinated, and many of the positive individuals in the study are exposed to the virulent strains of HPV that may lead to anal cancer and what have you. We're presenting this work at APHA. It's, this study's, this study's incredibly uh, demanding, but also incredibly, incredibly important. As you imagine, when you start with 18-year-olds, we have about 30 of them now. There's about 600 of them in the study who are transitioning. They're, they're gender also, right? So we've had to accommodate along the way in the study, the way we ask questions and what have you. So it's been a really, it's been one of those studies in my life that has really pushed us to think widely about how we do our work. Anyway, there's a lot of good stuff here. Um, and I, and, I, and I did, and I, 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 was, I was, I felt the need to do this study in part because I was tired of HIV prevention campaigns that were developed with people of my generation. And in fact said that for a new generation, HIV is a very different reality. And I actually have a paper out that should be coming out soon called the Worries Paper, where I say, yes, young gay men worry about HIV, but it's not the primary presenting problem it was when we were 18 years old in the 1980s. And for us as HIV prevention researchers to act that way is short-sighted. Why don't we do HIV prevention in the context of having them find an apartment or write a CV or find a job, and we draw them in that way, and then we do HIV prevention that way. So that's a huge sidebar once again. But anyway, what am I saying here? I'm saying here that this is the drug use of these young men. Not surprising, what do you see here? You see a lot of alcohol use, right? This is starting at 18, moving forward to their 21. Lots of alcohol use, even when they're not supposed to be drinking. Marijuana use, some ecstasy use. But meth, you don't really see there, right? Even over the course of the study. And in fact, um, here is, um, uh, just breaking it down, taking that those those little that little part at the bottom, the, the the part there, and sort of like blowing it up for you. In this slide, what you see here again, meth use, the blue is relatively low, right? 
and things that we think of often when we think about gay men and substance use in this in the population, ecstasy, cocaine, ketamine, meth, is not really evident at this point in the lives of these young people. And when you look at the very, very, very few who are actually using methamphetamine, these numbers are really unstable because the ends are the ends are really low here. Is like less than two percent are using meth, right now. And I can tell you, fast forward to the 23 or 24. It's not much more. I actually think what happens is it, it's like at 30 something happens. And I don't know what that is, but if I have this cohort at 30, which I hope the NIH does and will depend on what happens November 8th if they fund my study again. Um, <laughs> fingers crossed, everyone. Um, <laughs> I will be, I think I'm going to see a huge jump then. Right? Just, just like in the study, where, I, where so far in the study, almost every young person who's seroconverted is Hispanic or Latino so far, I think at 30 I'm going to start seeing the white guys seroconvert. This epidemiological phenomenon that sort of happens at 30. Anyway, um, and here's the mean numbers of days of use. So I'll leave it at that. So let me just, um, let me just conclude by just making some point. Um, there, there is meth use in the population. You all know it. It transcends demographic states. Right now, I believe it is more, in our state, it is more profoundly impacting black and Hispanic men, individuals who are of low SES and HIV positive individuals. It is not as prevalent in young people. So while it's a concern in the population, I go back to a point I said earlier, let's be careful of the, the term epidemic when we talk about this, about this problem. It's a problem. It's, and it's a problem we have to keep our eye on. Um, number two. Um, Meth use is combined with lots of other drugs, rarely used in us isolation. Um, it is uh, a drug of choice uh, that is not used by young men, but it may, may be used over time. And the question that I always ask about meth use is not so much why are gay men using meth, but why are gay men using drugs? And I think if we keep our eye on that, like what's the draw to drugs? What, is the, what, are, what are the triggers? What are the antecedents? It could, we could be talking about cocaine or heroin or meth or what have you. Meth in some ways ideal because of the sex piece, but substance use in general in the population, as the Institute of Medicine report showed us very clearly, is heightened in the LGBT population. Why does this continue to happen, right? And why does it, it'll be interesting in 20 years as rights and civil rights get better and better if we continue to see this pattern? Because then it turned if it doesn't change, it kind of debunks my social structural argument, right? So let's keep our eye on that. And I think the third thing I want to summarize today is, say, is, is this red point and say, psychosocial and mental health states, as well as the desire of a certain type of sex, may ultimately drive the use of this addiction, right? Methamphetamine must be thought of as a drug that is used to cope with you know, social isolation, but also with the, the many issues one faces in life, and also the, the, the reality of living with HIV. So, um, and again, back to the original point, it's not a simple unidirectional relationship. Um, it is highly, the drug is highly related to sexual adventurism. It may exacerbate HIV transmission and other STIs, but it may also ameliorate the burden of living with HIV. So meth and HIV, I believe, are complexly related and it's not a simple XY relationship. Uh, I don't remember if you saw this, uh, this slide. This is what started the conversation in New York City in 2003, and this was from, by Peter Staley, who is a really uh, important figure in the ACT UP movement. And so here's the, here's the myth. He spent $5,000 of his own money, and he put these posters together on bus stops in New York City, and he did, actually. And that got the New York City Department of Health to pay attention. But what you say, see there is, huge sale, buy crystal, get HIV for free, right? And this began the dialogue in New York City about meth. So um, I want to say that I think that when we think about drug use and we think about the drug sex link, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to conclude by giving you some, some final just broad thoughts about the, the way we're thinking about it as researchers that I think has implications for clinicians and for public health folks alike. Um, that a theory of syndemics is a really good way to think about substance use and to think about meth use, right? That the role of stigma and discrimination and homophobia and other burden, heightened mental health problems, heightened mental pro problems leads to substance use, substance use and heightened mental health problems lead to sexual risk taking behavior. What does this all say? That you have to, you can't deal with these things in isolation from each other, right? And in this paper that I wrote with Rich Walitsky and Greg Millett in 2013 to try to understand HIV in a new generation, 
you see very clearly that we think that HIV is part of a constellation of problems and that you have to target all these things together, right? You just can't do HIV prevention. You have to do HIV prevention and mental health counseling and substance use counseling and deal with violence and all of these things that are very true to the lives of gay men, right? And if you're really trying to address it, otherwise you're doing things piecemeal. Right? And I think that is, that, is, that is where we're sort of missing the mark in HIV prevention in our country. The other thing is to really to continue to keep in mind that this epidemic is, of course, driven by biological factors, but behavioral factors, but also structural and psychosocial factors. My doctoral student, Chris Stoltz, is doing an amazing amount of work on intimate partner violence. There is an amazing amount of intimate partner violence in young gay couples both as perpetrators and as victims. And he has shown very clearly in the work of his dissertation the association between those, that, le that level of violence, and both substance use and sexual risk-taking behavior. And so how do we think of as psychologists and counselors and social workers intervening on those aspects of young gay men's lives, in addition to just HIV? I think we've had 30-something years of defining gay men's health solely by HIV. And we can't keep doing that if we're going to move forward in our conversation. And so a model for health has to be a model for holistic health that, int that, int that, that addresses the confluences all of these, all of these problems. That, and I think current HIV strategies, many of the behavioral ones, are band-aids to the solution. The questions I would be asking, we should be asking ourselves right now are, why in this era of biomedical interventions, when we have PrEP and we have treatment as prevention, now granted, New York State's numbers were really great last year, right, like down like a lot, right, and we're better than most states. But you go to Atlanta and you go to Mississippi and you go to Alabama and the epidemic looks like it did in the 1980s in the black population there, right, of gay men. Um, why is it that we are continuing to see minimal uptake of PrEP in gay men. Almost every study that's been published recently shows 10% of young HIV ne of HIV negative men are on PrEP. And who are the ones who are on PrEP? Often white middle class guys in their 30s. So we're not doing something right here. Like what, what are the obstacles that are preventing young black men who need this drug from getting this drug? And the beautiful New York State Department of Health actually was kind enough to give us some money last year, and we did a study on that. And, you know, I'll tell you this. I'll tell you that the, men in, the young men in our study tell us, two, tell us a few things. They tell us, one, where they go for when they have a cold and where they go when they have a discharge are two different places because this person is not able to deal with this issue. So that's a problem right in and of itself in terms of the experience. But also the obstacles of PrEP and of healthcare are the the actual physical barriers, the, the steps that they have to take to get there. So if we want PrEP and we want pr young men to take PrEP, we need to take it to them. We can't expect for them to come to it. And I personally don't know how we would expect PrEP to work effectively and to be, and be taken by a population that really needs it when we know, one, men access health care less than women. This is true for gay men. This is true for young gay men. Yet with PrEP, we expect somebody to keep going back to the doctor when they're not even going to the doctor. So, yeah, I think the answer is the injectable. When we get to the injectable and it becomes more like a flu shot and you can go once a year or twice a year, I think we're gonna see much better outcomes. And I don't think we're that far away from that, actually. Um, finally, uh, drug use treatment can be an efficient tool for leveraging sexual risk reduction. This gets back to my point that mental health and drug use and HIV have to be thought of in combination. You know, addressing the meth sex link in practice, I think, is just some of the many things I've talked about today. Treatment modalities around meth use need to, uh, need to also deal with sex. You can't talk about meth without talking about sex. You can't talk about sex without talking about the role of the community. You can't talk about the role of community without talking the, about the role of discrimination and what have you, that all of these things have to be dealt with together. And finally, I'll leave you this slide, which is actually really interesting, that my friend Hank Scott, who now, who used to um, live in New York City and then lived in, uh, um, uh, in Ulster County and now has made his way to West Hollywood, okay, um, is actually a, runs a, uh, a small uh, PR firm there, and he wrote a couple of editorials. And what his argument is, and I think something that, uh, something that is a challenge to all of us, is that in the era of non-bars and non-clubs, Grindr and other social networking apps are the way that people are not only meeting their sexual partners, but also how they're getting their drugs, right? And what, what kind of legislation do we need there to prevent that kind of, 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 of transfer of illegal behaviors um, 
in a site where young men are really vulnerable. All right, so so that's the last slide. I'll show it to you if you have any questions. Can you read that to us? I can't. Oh, okay, I will read it to you. I will start at the top. In the yellow, it says T, and then the blue says yes, and then the blue says what can I get for you, and then the yellow says how much, and then the blue says 75 for Tina, which I put two grams, and then the yellow says cool, got to go to the arm, and then the guy says, I, guy, boy, the person says okay, and then it says I also take PayPal credit card, credit or debit and checks. What's your address so I can plan delivery? Hey man, do you still want the T, T-E-A? You can just let me know, no biggie, just want to know so I'm not anticipating. So the selling of drugs on this site that's supposed to be t about meeting partners is another avenue in which we're introducing individuals who are highly vulnerable to the use of this substance um, um, in the era of non, in the era of non-bars and non-clubs. So that's what that shows up there. Um, and finally, I'll say to you if you have any other questions after this, after I'm gone, um, that's my website, that's my uh, website of my, um, of my research center, and that's my Twitter account, and thank you very much for being such a great audience.